everybody. This is Aaron Simmons, and welcome to Two Philosophers, One Conversation, where we do our best to think about philosophy for the public good. I'm joined today by a friend of mine, a colleague, and actually a former student, someone that I am amazingly proud of, uh, Jocelyn Bulware, who has a background in philosophy, but also a master's degree in theological studies from Vanderbilt, my own alma mater, what what? And uh, her specialty is in value theory with an emphasis on the intersection of race and social justice. And currently, in addition to being a public speaker and an author, she is working right now in a middle school um, in a special needs class in a rural impoverished community. So basically putting everything she's ever learned into practice on the ground in some of the, the hardest human conditions that exist. So I'm thrilled to have her on today's episode and think with her a little bit about where we are in light of uh, the social isolation, the social distancing that's going on right now globally, and how it affects who we are as uh, beings defined by categories like race, like class, like gender, but also um, thinking about this as it relates to questions of faith traditions and how we make sense of ourselves in light of the religious responses that are and are not happening in different sorts of communities and really appreciate your time today. Yes, of course, thank you for having me. So maybe we can start off today by simply uh, hearing a little bit about your own perspective on uh, this, this crisis that we face globally. We're all being asked to stay home. We're being asked not to engage each other, not to uh, shake hands, you know, to blow kisses from at least six feet away. And yet this kind of runs at odds with the social dynamics that your training cultivates, this, you might say, table fellowship that we are hoping to, you know, engage in with others with different backgrounds and different walks of life. But now we're being asked to sort of, you know, go back to our homes and shut the doors for a little while. How does this sort of human existence and experiment in social distancing, how does this raise certain questions or issues for you um, that, you know, intersect with this history and background that you've got? Hmm. So I'm going to list a couple of things and then expound on them and we're going to have this conversation. One, it's still the season of Lent. And I was reading on social media, one, I think social media is an excellent or can be an excellent platform for engaging voices that sometimes we as academics don't hear or we are trained to see them as less legitimate than other voices. And I saw this post that said, during the Lenten season, what an amazing, amazing, amazing practice of Lent than to refuse to do the thing that we are most urged to do. Mm. What an amazing Lenten practice to be able to then resist the things that we have been trained to want. So whether some of us give up caffeine, we have been trained under this capitalistic system and under the schema to be super productive, to be hyper productive. And so we need to be bolstered by things like caffeine, what it means to refuse in mm. this religious space where we are honestly leaning into a more Jewish practice of neighborliness. What does it mean to then resist that for the sake of our neighbor? And I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about this space relative to the Lenten season, um, to the season of like celebration, to the season of really celebrating neighborliness and all that it means. I'm also really moved by looking at this uh, passage by Kitty O'Mara, I think I'm saying that correct. It says, I'll read it here. It says, and the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows and the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. I think there's something beautiful about the way that our moment has been fractured, not broken, but fractured so that something like healing can enter. And I am just so deeply moved by that. I 
follow the NAP ministry. It's a beautiful online resource, but it is about fully, for Black folks in particular, embracing rest as a way to connect with our ancestors, as a way of resisting the capitalist moment that just urges us to push, 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 push. Because for so many of us, for Black men in particular, and Black women, especially in church spaces, it has been like work, 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 work. I think that there's a beautiful thing about taking in this rest in this mandatory moment of stop, this mandatory moment of pause to allow something possibly more beautiful, more redemptive, more healing to enter into our space. So yeah. that's what I've been thinking about from a spiritual side, from the material side, working with my students in the middle school, I'm thinking about how are my kids going to eat if some of them are going back to homes that are not as safe as the schoolhouse. What are we doing to protect their safety? What are we doing for folks who we say quarantine, 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 and yet they're quarantined with folks who abuse them, whether it is physically, emotionally, sexually, in any of those ways. I, this idea of quarantine, while it can be a beautiful thing, as I just mentioned, it can also be a disastrous thing. Mm -hmm. And if we are only hearing disastrous or my gut was to say incompetent, but what I'm going to say is incomplete mm. moments and things from our administration. And how are we fully going to be able to exist in this way together to make neighborliness, not just an end, but the thing that we've been operating from. And on the spiritual side, it reminds me of the passage, you know, that says we gain our souls in patience. Mm -hmm. And I don't think patience is a virtue that is often in high demand these days. Uh, and yet it, it tends to a strange thing. It, it tends to be the virtue that you might say um, the, the ruling classes want to cultivate in the working classes so that they can be patient enough not to revolt, right? Not, not to overthrow the power structures. Um, and yet we live in a society that says the only way that you would move up, the only way that you would get what you want, the only way that you, you know, make it rain, as it were, is if you're not waiting for something to happen to you, but you go out and make it happen for yourself. I, I think of that Dead Prez uh, album called Get Free. Mm -hmm. And it's one of these great titles because it's almost like, you know, Get Free! Exclamation point. Not a, hey, freedom is there. Let's figure out how to navigate it. It's like, no, we're going to go get freedom <laughs> and, and we're going to move out of the way the obstacles that stand in our path. And there's something really powerful about that, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also something about um, this need to speed up in accessing the future that we hope for rather than being able to rest into the present that we already have. Mm -hmm. And somehow if we can find ways to say, what is it we were actually trying to do all of this for? Then maybe it allows us in this moment of, you know, forced shutdown to think about, well, we, we've, we've been working all of our lives to be able to retire. <laughs> we, we work in order to shut down, to take vacation where you don't have to go to work. Right now, we're not having to go to work in the, the traditional sense, lots of people, and those who are continuing to have to go to work, the ones that have to are also the ones that we now hopefully begin to recognize and realize are making our lives possible, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 you know, my garbage can just got picked up a few minutes ago and I realized, wow, it didn't even occur to me this morning, what am I going to do with all of my trash? Mm -hmm. It was like, I, I knew they were going to come and take care of it for me. And sure enough, they did. So while I'm at home working, they're out still risking themselves to make sure that human society continues unabated. And I think that's that spiritual material intersection that you're describing so profoundly. It, it's hard not to feel guilty if you are one of the ones who, you know, can say yes to all of the if you can statements that our leaders have been saying. If you can work from home, please do. If you can keep your children out of school, please do. If you can cut back on this, that, please do. And, you know, I'm very blessed and find myself saying yes to all of the if you can statements. And yet part of why I think we've got an imperative to say yes to all of those is because there are so many people who can't say yes to them. And so I know the people who are out, you know, uh, doing the work in the hospitals, <laughs> in the 
the supermarkets, making sure there's food for the rest of us who need to restock, that they are made safer by our developing the patience that doesn't require everything in an immediate sort of tangible way. Let me ask you this way. What do you think are the ways that rest can be cultivated in a time when we also find ourselves with such inequities, where those who are in some sense most able to rest during this kind of crisis are those who are most unworried and unconcerned about having to pay the mortgage because their salaries are continuing to populate through auto deposit in their bank accounts. Yeah. You and I both have loved ones working gig economies mm -hmm. that are underinsured. And if they don't work, they don't get paid, they can't pay their bills, and they've also got less health coverage in case they get sick. Like, how is it that we navigate this inequity precisely in a moment where it seems like we've got to be most intentional about resting and yet resting in ways that cause us to focus on those who cannot? I'm going back to some some like pillars of normative ethics. I'm curious if we should then approach this through like a deontological means and we should say, if you can do this no matter what, like mm -hmm. this is a full stop, we should be able to achieve this through reason, we should be able to do this because it just makes sense to do this. Then I'm curious what it would look like if we approach this through more of a utilitarian mechanism and we were to say like, we do this because this will all, this will minimize the good while also minimizing the harm. I think I'm gonna give you a very honest answer, which is, I don't know. And I think that is something that we as folks who like to say that we're thinking about this honestly, and we're thinking about this well. Let me actually take that back. I think for a lot of folks who like to say we're thinking about this well, we often don't think about it honestly. Mm. And my honest answer is that I don't know how to appropriately navigate while putting demands on myself that I recognize are unfair and unethical and honestly immoral to put those demands on other folks. Mm. And yet I do think that we have to return back to this concept of neighborliness, which mm. is in order for me to best care for the folks who cannot say yes to those I can statements, then we have to take it as incumbent upon ourselves to do that. Mind you, although I have this position at this middle school, if I do not have to go to the school when the children are not in the school and I don't get paid, and I recognize that there are so many folks, a lot of folks who whose universities are closing, right? I mean. We, you were my teacher. And so I recognize what it's like to be in a university space where I, even as a resident director, realized that there were students who, when we were saying we have a home at Furman, they literally meant Furman was their home. They had, they rarely, like, they may not have had other places to go back to. Now, rarely did that happen because of the particular socioeconomic makeup of Furman, probably. But if it happens to one, then we have to consider everybody. I have been going back to this, what does it truly mean to take care of the least of these? What does it truly mean to take care of the most vulnerable? I do think that with a certain amount of privilege comes that obligation that we have to care for our neighbors that then makes us have to say yes. It is a compulsory yes. You know, when you say, I just don't know, one of the things I think that is profoundly present across lots of the global traditions uh, commonly called religious and also across the great moral views uh, in, in philosophical history is the virtue of humility, right? Mm -hmm. And not only moral humility, where we may not you know, be able to act the right way because morality is difficult, but also epistemic humility, where even knowing what the right thing to do or how to act is something that's really complicated. Something that has been staggering to me in the last few weeks is the relationship between trust and humility. I find that I am trusting the voices of those experts, right? You know, the scientific experts, the World Health Organization experts, the political leaders. I trust them more when they're saying, here's what we don't know. 
Yes. And here, here's the question marks that we're trying to figure ways through. But here's what we do know. And so the gap between what we do and what we don't is where we're going to have to put our efforts and our energy. Rather than acting, hey, we've got this figured out. Here's how we handle it. Knock down, boom. I, I, I start not trusting those voices because it seems like that they're disconnected from the messiness of the human condition, which whether religiously, ethically, spiritually, or just materially, question marks are everywhere, right? So how do you see that relationship between humility and trust, especially for communities that may have historical reasons not to see trust as rampant relative to their leaders, right? I mean, it, it seems to me that, that the most marginalized in our community would have maximal reasons to be distrusting of the voices telling them you're going to be okay. And yet somehow the voices that are probably worthy of trust right now are the ones who are saying, I can't tell you you're going to be okay, but here's what I can tell you. I mean, how, how do we walk that line in these sorts of communities and these sorts of spaces? So as you were talking about this chasm between trust and humility, immediately what popped into my mind is that that verse, faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. There you go. And I'm thinking there has to be something about faith that lives in that liminal space. I'm sure you know this, but you know, faith and trust are the same word, the yes. yes. And so I think sometimes when we talk about people of faith in times of crisis, what we really should talk about, those who have cultivated trust as a way of life yes. in times of crisis. Yes. And yet, I, I'm not sure that we then, um, you know, those of us who identify as people of trust in that sense, mm-hmm. I don't know if we've necessarily got a history that makes us trustworthy times have been woefully inadequate in leading the way in public health or leading the way in neighborliness, the very virtue that you're trying to cultivate. So how do you see like that gap being overcome right now in a time where we need the populace to trust its leaders? We need our leaders to be humble enough to tell us the truth, but we've also got to trust each other in order to make sure that we somehow make it through this without it being more than we can handle. So I'll say this, I have a friend who I went to Vandy with, to Vandy Did, and she is now a PhD student at Princeton. She went to the AUC, which is the Atlanta University Center, which are the three HBCUs, Selman, Morehouse, and Clark Atlanta. She and, she went to Clark Atlanta, and there is a friend of hers who, who went to Spelman, and they both graduated since gone on and done really cool things. And they, in my opinion, are doing one of the most beautiful things about how to cultivate trustworthiness in your communities of accountability. So there was a mandate in the AUC that all the students needed to disperse in light of this virus, which is totally understandable given all the CDC recommendations. They are trying to practice social distancing at their best. What they perhaps didn't take into consideration were the needs of the students who are students in the AUC. We saw just last year, but the person who gave the commencement speech at Morehouse forgave $40 million in student debt, $40 million for 400 students. So like, that, that's a conversation all its own that we'll have to touch on at a later topic. But you have incredible needs of these students. And so my classmate and her colleague have been coming together and rallying support with an alumni from the AUC, from Greater Atlanta, and from the New York space in particular to find ways to crowdfund money for these students to ensure that they will be able to get where they need to go. They have been posting these things online to try to grab people's attention to be able to donate money. I read a story where there was someone who just secured an internship in Harlem starting in May, but that person could not, for a variety of reasons, go back to their home space before their Harlem internship happened. They rallied together, found a housing solution for this person to already be in Harlem the person is there in a safe space. That to me is how we cultivate trustworthiness 
in our community. So in womanist theology, there's this idea of having a community of accountability where we really ask as like black hip hop folks have been asking for a very long time, who are your people? Mm. And once you find and once you feel your people, you rally for them, you do for them what perhaps our leaders are not doing so that they'll say, even if I can't wield my faith toward the direction that it lands in the hands or in the lap of my leadership, I know that I can wield my trust and in turn, I can wield my faith toward my community because I know that in a sense, they will be my Aaron and my Ur if I'm Moses. They will be those people to bolster me up. There will be those people who I can always count on. Like Will Smith said, you need your mama and you need your them. Like you need your mama and them. How are you going to be in a sort of existential but also material way people's them? One of the things that I have been wrestling with a lot is, you know, how is it that we bear the burdens of others given that there are simply so many others? Um, yeah. This is a traditional question asked to uh, Levinasian scholars. I, I, for listeners that may not know, Emmanuel Levinas, a 20th century philosopher, says that we're infinitely obligated to every other person. <clears throat> well, the problem, of course, is I, I can't even discharge infinite obligation to one person. So as soon as you add another, now I'm doubly infinitely obligated. And so it seems like it would yield a kind of quietism or just resignation there's nothing I can do to ever get out from underneath this weight and this guilt and this pressure to serve. <clears throat> so why even try? And I think in times of global crises, <laughs> two realizations have hit me really strongly these last weeks. One, wow, our world is small. <laughs> I mean, like th th think of how far away Australia feels to South Carolina or how far away Alaska or parts of the you know, frozen Siberia are from where I find myself or South Africa, whatever. And yet the virus in just a few weeks, it's hit all of us, right? So we are globally small in a way that I don't think we were three months ago. <laughs> and yet at the same time, what I think we're realizing is the shared need is massive. <laughs> so when we start thinking about impacts of scale, I, I, I get overwhelmed almost trying to just follow the math, yeah. right? Of, oh, you, you hear reports of a two to 3% death rate, say, right? And some think it's maybe a slightly lower because of the untested. Some think it's maybe a little bit higher because of the way that it's working its way through the system. But even if we say two to three, well, what gambling, uh, I mean, we, we would all take a 97 to 98% chance of winning, right? We, we would put money on that all day long. And yet, when you start scaling up, you realize this is tens of millions of deaths, <laughs> right? So somehow we are globally small, globally shrunk, and yet mathematically exponentially big. And so when you think about, well, what then can I do? Walt Whitman has that great poem, uh, O Me, O Life, where he says, what good amidst these, O Me, O Life? <laughs> You know, I find myself asking that question. So what is it we can do? What is it I can do when it turns out, e even if I took all of my savings to try to pay the needs of, you know, one or two or three people who might be struggling, I'm quickly going to run out of every penny I've got. But then there's going to be a fourth and fifth and hundred thousand needing that kind of help and support. So how do we avoid what we might call the uh, exhaustion or the the resignation that no matter how much I do I just can't do enough how do we keep picking ourselves up and I ask this in particular given your work on <clears throat> black religious traditions where this liberationist idea of how do we keep moving forward despite the difficulties that we face it seems to me that there's a real wisdom and resource in those traditions for all of us trying to figure out how then do we move forward because it seems like nothing I do will be sufficient. How, how do you uh, uh, speak truth or speak wisdom or, or preach to that person struggling to do the right thing but recognizing the task is just bigger than me? Um, I'm thinking about all the times that 
my mom and my grandma have been saying things like, girl, I know you may think that this is about you, but this is not about you right now. This is yeah. not about you. I'm thinking about a conversation I had with my mom just yesterday when we were talking about making a final grocery store list. And she said, do you mind going to get it? Because although I'm 10 years out from my cancer treatments, I still might be immunocompromised. Do you mind going to get it? I'm like, yes, of course. Do I want to go? Am I going to? <laughs> Absolutely. And I do yeah. think that there's something about this idea that it is not about us and yet it depends on us. That is absolutely, I think you pinned the word correctly, it's exhausting. Yeah. It is exhausting in a way that then makes our efforts seem futile. Something I was thinking about a couple of days ago, precisely in that line, um, what was the way in which Kierkegaard has this line where he says, it's upbuilding to think about that in relation to God, we're always wrong. And of course, you might say, how could that possibly be a building? That's the worst thing, right? I'm, I'm always wrong. But, but then you realize, oh, but wait a minute. No, this is precisely the narrative of these trust traditions is <clears throat> it's not about you. And ultimately, it's not up to you. But yet, at the same time that you realize both of those things, you recognize, if not me, then who? Right. So somehow both have to be in play that as as millions and billions are crying out, you know, God save us. Mm -hmm. It also something that's powerful about liberation theology is we find an account of the divine that then says my saving power is activated by your outstretched arm of support and charity to those who need it. Schema of process theology which right. is like some people will ask for the entire cake and yet they'll have the eggs, the oil, the cake mix, the vanilla, the <laughs> coconut or whatever in it, it'll all be in front of you. And so it's like the divine will put things in your pathway for then you to then activate to go get instead of just giving you or gifting you the end that you desire. I'm thinking about that verse that we all hear through relative ways, which is like faith without works is dead. And so even the other day when my mom and I were having this conversation about the grocery list, she was saying, do we walk in fear? Absolutely. Yeah. But do we walk in wisdom? Absolutely. Yeah. And so there's this thing about walking in wisdom that I think is central to what I would like to say all of our faith traditions, but particularly for a form of Black liberation theology, walking in that wisdom, walking in the autonomy that socially folks who look like me have been stripped of in relationship with the divine is a resource, as you say, that I think offers a wealth of knowledge that we should be able to draw from. So in the same vein that it is not about us, and yet we are dependent on us. I think, again, that creates a sort of obligation by which we then have to say, to your point, if not me, then who? Yeah. Yeah. And yet the answer to that almost becomes, well, everybody who can. And then we look at the systemic ways in which folks actually cannot. And then I think it requires a twofold response. I think it requires something like you staying at home, me coming to take care of my little cousin while my aunt has to go take her father-in-law to the doctor. It comes, it comes by us being the community. We love this phrase to be the church. It comes by us doing those things and also advocating for folks who may not be able to advocate for themselves while also listening to their concerns. This whole idea of like, um, what's this idea of like, I'm speaking for people who can't talk. Yeah just irks me, honestly. Yeah. I'm like, people have been talking for millennia. Mm -hmm. people, have, people have been talking. Maybe we don't understand their language. We need to learn it. Or maybe we just haven't been listening. We need to soften our ears. So as we're coming to a close in this conversation, what is it that you would see as maybe the lessons that you would most want listeners to take from the background that you bring to the table, the experiences that you have working with these rural uh, middle school children who in fact do lack uh, so, so, so much. 
how, how is it that you would encourage all of us to then find the strength to rest and to discover the neighborliness that comes from increased isolation? Yet it may be the case that paradox is what invites us to really find beauty that uh, we, we see this, you know, in a religious tradition as well, that we get you know, beauty for ashes, right? That there's this Linton, back to where we started, this Linton reality that putting ashes on one's forehead, that recognizing when things get stripped away, we find out what really matters. We come to the bedrock of, of who we are and, and why it matters that we continue to be who we are. What are some of these takeaways that you would have for the listeners about how best to be um, neighborly, how best to be themselves, how best to be invested in each other, despite the fact that we are increasingly isolated and scared? I think if there's one thing that we can do, turn off your television, turn off your computer, not maybe turn it off, but like log off your social media, and just find a moment to sit. There was one time where I was in a class of yours, I think, and it was my senior year. I was in philosophy of religion. I was super, super overwhelmed with everything that was going on. And I remember us sitting outside in the hallway and you saying, sometimes you need some butt in seat time to get things done. <laughs> Even now that my sister is in a quasi quarantine at home doing e-learning with her university, I'm telling her, have some butt in seat time, some quality yeah. butt in seat time to get things done. I think so often we think um, of like that hustle and flow. I was reading this book, Elaine Walter, where it's more than enough. She's the former editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue. And toward the end of her book, she says, I am able to flow because I hustle. And I am able to hustle because I flow. Nice. I think there's something in that duality that we can all learn from in this moment, that we can learn to say I have done enough yeah. and I am gifting myself. I'm gifting myself the ability to recognize that this moment is a gift. Although it is like a dagger in some ways. I know that folks are dealing with incredible disappointment as a world, as you were saying about just the numbers of death that are keep going, going up and up and up every day. We as an earth are grieving. I was sitting watching the news and we just got the new number that was coming in from Iran. It was like 900 new deaths a day. And my mom just put her hands, put her face in her hands and just like wept. We are dealing with, as we all now know, something that we've never seen before. This moment is something that, we'll never seen, that we've never seen before. And it reminds me of, it immediately took me back to being a little girl sitting in my grandma's Baptist church. And the pastor would open by saying, this is the day that we have never seen before and that we will never see again. Yeah. There's something about this moment that I think is calling us to the possible best versions of ourselves. We are learning so much about disability activism during this time. We're actually paying attention to Black Twitter and to disability Twitter. And we are opening new space for political conversations, for climate change conversations, for air travel. Our, go back to the passage from earlier, our earth in some way is beginning to heal because we are healing as people, as a culture and as a people. Um, and so I would just invite everyone into the gift that is this moment and to recognize that in this moment we can flow because we've hustled and recognize that for the folks who are continuing to hustle, to not make it hard for them when they flow. Too often I think we think that philosophy is a flow in relation to the world's hustle. And what we probably should recognize is that nah, philosophy for the most part is also an awful lot of hustle and it's publishing and it's teaching and getting lectures ready and reading things and trying to always do more and more and more. And yet at the end of the day, you know, like we say with this, this uh, podcast that it's two philosophers, one conversation. The, the whole idea is we're all in this together. There only has ever been one conversation. And that conversation is how do we live lives of meaning? given that we live lives that are mortal <laughs> and yes. it, it, this is hard work and it, it's bigger than all of us and thank 
goodness, thank God that it's not just about us because yes. I know all of us are inadequate, but yet maybe together we can find ways to hustle and flow um, and, and create the rhythm that life really needs right now. So I think one last thing that I will add, um, I'm often thinking about the question, what do I want from my life? I think all of us right now are asking in some question whether we are new to like homeschooling our children or whether we are spending a significant amount of time with our partners who we haven't because of work schedule seen actually seen in like five years. I think we're all spending that time. I would encourage everyone to recognize that there is no way to do it right, but there's a way to have meaning to it. There's no way to do it right, and yet everything can have meaning. And if we try our best to look for the meaning, to make the meaning, um, then I think that maybe we have a shot at making making meaning after this moment as well. Because this moment, as we all know, we all are crossing our fingers and hoping and praying and relying, as my grandma would say, on that blessed assurance that we know that we know that we know yeah. that this moment will pass. Um, let's also think about in this moment and beyond this moment, how we can best, again, take care of ourselves and take care of our neighbors. So thank you for having me on. And as of course, I look forward to chatting with you soon. Absolutely. Well, Jocelyn, thank you again for being with us. To all of our listeners, thanks for joining us today. We hope to provide more content at Two Philosophers, One Conversation, where philosophy for the public good is simply what philosophy has always been about.